In this session, we're going to conclude our exploration of the consensus uh, methods for research and look at how the data that we're able to collect from various consensus processes can be used and analyzed so we can make effective use of that data um, for research purposes. And we'll also look at the use of visualizations to help us not only present that data, but also analyze the data through various uh, visualization techniques. So this week, what we're looking at is statistical analysis. Now this worries a lot of students, uh, particularly coming from an education background or a non-technical background, as statistics does by its nature involve some use of mathematics. However, for those of you that aren't familiar with mathematics, um, we're only going to touch on it at a relatively superficial level. But there are lots of terms and um, processes in statistical mathematics and in any area of mathematics that you need to be relatively aware of. Of course, you're going to see these in a lot of research reports. Now, even though you may not use them yourself, you will need to be able to at least understand somewhat what people are talking about when they discuss such terms. We're also going to explore the concept of bias in a bit more detail and as I mentioned the concept of data visualization. So statistical analysis. Now essentially this is a way of collecting, organizing and analyzing and interpreting and presenting data. So it's nothing particularly magical. It's simply a way of <sighs> approaching how we understand the information that we've been able to collect through our research um, and use some mathematical processes, such as adding up a series of numbers. That's a mathematical process. Um, so in Delphi studies and other social um, studies, we often want to look at some more detail other than just averages or totals. So one measure that's commonly used is what's called um, a measure of central tendency or level of dispersion. How much the data or the expected responses are differing from what we would expect a random response to show. And we use here terms such as standard deviation and interquartile range, but essentially we're just looking at how widely spread are the results from our participants um, and if they were just purely random how our results are different from a completely randomized um, response so we also look at the concept of median values when we're sort of getting a group of responses around several options so if they're choosing say um, one to five on a what we call a likert scale or A to E, um, a median value is not just the average, but it looks at that over the number of responses. But these terms can be important when we come to analyze, but in the main, we think about what we want to actually say, and then we use the mathematics to support those arguments. Um, now those coming from a quantitative perspective, do it in the reverse. They look at the statistics and then they look at how the statistics tell us what the results are. In qualitative research it often goes the other way where we look at what the research is telling us and then we try to think okay what sort of ways can we present that information in a way that then elaborates on and expands upon the story that we're trying to explain from the qualitative research data that we've been able to collect. So there are a range of different techniques that are used. Um, a very simple one is interquartile range, and I've provided you a link with a little refresher on that. It's really simple once you actually do it, as is most mathematical techniques used in statistics. Statistics is not really complex mathematics. It uses a whole lot of very complex sounding terms, but when you actually come to apply them, 
they're actually quite simple. Now, how you then interpret them and what they mean can be problematic if you don't have a background in understanding the mathematics involved in statistics. But for most academics purposes, where you already know what the results are telling you and you just want some support for that, then some of the basic statistical techniques can be used to support that. Okay, so Kendall's coefficient is one that's used a lot with um, rankings. When we have a, a various um, ranked respondents from a range of different participants in a study, as you have done with your um, Delphi study. So again, this is saying that we're using this strange term called Kendall's W range. But all it means is that if, the, if that value is zero, then there was no agreement at all. And if the value was one, there was complete agreement. And if it's somewhere in between, then that is a measure of the level of agreement. And there's some mathematics involved in calculating that, which you don't need to be um, across. There are a whole range of different tools that we can use to assist us in performing these calculations. Um, and I've provided you a link to stats to do, which will allow you to put in the respondents from each of your participants and calculate the W value or the Kendall's W value. And then you could report on the level of agreement mathematically calculated that your participants had. And it sounds more impressive than um, just presenting the data and so forth. Nothing particularly magical about the value. It does involve a little bit of statistical calculations, but it's not overly um, illuminating. But it does give you a little bit more strength to your presentation of your, of your research results when you can cite this. Now, unfortunately for the study that we've done with co-joint pairs, uh, because you can't separate out each individual respondent, you can't actually apply Kendall's W value. Um, but if you had each of their responses on paper and you could see, okay, this person gave responses to these questions in, in this way and so forth, you could then put that data into um, stats to do and it will provide you with the W value. And that's essentially how most statistical mathematics occurs. We use online tools, um, put in the values as indicated by the tool, and it gives us these arcane um, values with strange sounding names and letters and so forth. Now, for those of us with a mathematical background, we can understand how that actually works. And we can also see where people can make mistakes. But the tools now are such that it's, it's relatively hard for people to make mistakes if they put in the data correctly. Um, and they can then report on these values with a degree of assurance that they are not making a fool of themselves, even though they don't really understand the mathematics behind things. Okay, and this just again goes through Kendall's W values. Um, and you could then put that table into your um, research report. You could cite the um, W value that you've been able to achieve in terms of the level of agreement from your participants and you could say then that there was a high confidence that um, the agreement was achieved um, and that a strong agreement was developed around this such and such and use the appropriate academic language to support the argument that you're presenting. Okay so some other things that we can try to tell from the data we're collecting from things such as the Delphi study is if agreement was achieved too quickly. So sometimes we can measure the length of time people take to um, participate in surveys, um, how many clicks they put into their uh, co-joint pair um, round, how quickly they made those choices. These things can all be measured. Now, it's a little bit easier though if you've got them in a face-to-face -face discussion group. If everyone comes into agreement in the first five minutes, then that's a pretty good indication they may not have really thought through the issue and given it its due attention in terms of considering alternatives and so forth. 
when we do things digitally and particularly anonymously, it makes it a little bit harder to make such judgments, but not impossible, particularly with digital tools now being able to track um, what's occurring by the participants. But essentially, if things happen too quickly, then, then it gives an indication that they may not have really, that the choice was maybe too obscure or alternatively, it just might have been so well understood that everyone automatically was in agreement because there was just no dissension about the question that you were asking. Um, it also may have been that you led the uh, introductory material in, in such a way that uh, everyone knew what sort of response you wanted. And so they provided that to you. Um, and also it may have just been that the participants were unable to or unwilling to contemplate other possibilities. Um, if the possibilities maybe resulted in them losing their jobs or a large number of people that they care about or some consequences that they just didn't want to countenance, um, that may lead them towards a particular perspective um, too quickly. So you need to be looking at this and this is a form of bias. Now there are a range of other biases that can occur in any research project. We're going to look particularly at the ones focused on um, consensus research and how these may occur as part of the Delphi process. Now sometimes we use bias uh, positively uh, we want to have a consensus develop. We want things to emerge that result in a consensus. So we are trying to direct what's occurring to some degree. But particularly unintended bias can introduce things negatively into our results. So the first is around collective unconsciousness, which is essentially where everyone comes to a particular agreement on something because everyone else is coming to an agreement on that. Um, and you don't want to be dissenting or be seen to be out of touch or ignorant. Um, and so these things can sort of, societal pressures can push us towards a particular perspective. Another is if a question just proceeding or an issue being discussed just proceeding was, had an undue influence on the question we're now looking at. Um, if, say, a question was ask, asking you whether or not um, everyone will lose their job as a result of new technologies, and then the next question is um, what new technologies might have the least impact upon the workplace, then you may be considering things in a very different light, having just been thinking about everyone losing their jobs as a result of the, the technology. Um, if the preceding question had been what benefits can be derived from new technologies and then the question is how could we best implement new technologies that may give you a completely different perspective on how to address the question. Um, sometimes we disregard randomness in studies. Um, one happens a lot in education is we compare uh, class groups we get a new educational technology, we put them into the, these different classes, and we measure the effects of the technology um, in terms of the performance of the students in those two groups. But that's neglecting the fact that one group may have just quite randomly had all A students, and the other group quite randomly had all, all Bs and C or, or Bs and E students, Ds and Es. And just by random chance, one group was much more likely to be more effective with using that technology, or indeed anything that they were going to be doing, than the other group. So we have to always be mindful that there can be uh, probability can have a play in research that we're exploring. Then there's what's called the von Rostenhoff effect. And this is where, I sort of alluded to this before, where we get focused on an extreme outcome. So again, so if we're talking about introduction of educational technologies, we ask the question, what educational technologies is most likely to destroy the world? Um, that's a pretty extreme question and how we actually respond to that could be quite extreme. But likewise, um, we have another one, which is the recency effect. If 
a few days before you have your participants do their survey, um, someone is killed as a result of an educational technology. Say they were using some, being bullied online and they committed suicide, something like that. And then you ask a question about how what, uh, the effectiveness of online video conferencing for homework study. The recency of that occurrence could impact upon you in terms of the von Rotterdam effect. But likewise, the recency effect can occur with the series of questions in terms of the order that they're being asked in. And this can be referred to as the my side bias, where Oh, so you, where we oh, so the my side bias is more, and we don't want to have countering opinions. We want everyone wants to be on the same side, but the recency effect can also relate to the um, how the questions are ordered. So if you've got all positive questions and then all negative questions, that can affect things in one way. Um, if you've got an extreme question followed by a, a quite a um, un presupposing question, then it may influence how people respond to the unpresupposing question and things of that nature. Okay, so the primacy effect is similar where the initial questions we ask can then result in a whole lot of other responses. So if we ask a really um, significant question that gets people thinking about things in one particular way at the start, that may then influence their subsequent responses. And then we have the dominance effect, which we've talked a bit about during the Delphi study, where the reason why we have them anonymous is that if someone has a lot of influence over others, they can then skew the um, study towards that particular bias that they hold. Okay, so there's various ways of addressing those um, in Delphi studies and a lot of it is around having the participants justify their positions and explain why they um, made choices or not. Um, Randomising the, the order of the questions to get those sort of recency and primacy effects out of the way. Um, trying to record the level of severity of the ratings that participants have to various um, options. Uh, Again, having multiple rounds so that and with randomized questions so that we can then see that um, the influence of preceding questions is is disrupted because different preceding questions will occur in other rounds and so forth. So there are ways of addressing bias, but they need to be thought through when you do research studies and to consider the, the implications of um, various things that can influence the outcomes of the research. Okay, so once we have this data, then we need to start visualizing it. Oh, so we have to start analyzing it. Now, some of the bias can actually be on the researcher, how we actually interpret the data. Um, and so being able to interpret data effectively is important. And one way of assisting people to interpret data and also to present data to others to explain that, explain the results, is through data visualizations. And there are a range of different techniques and tools we can use for visualizations. The simplest one that's been around for a long time is the use of graphs. Um, taking a whole lot of numerical data, which is very hard generally to interpret just by looking at it, and using color and shape and trends, present that in a way that people can see the relationship between the numerical data much more effectively. The human brains have been developed through evolutionary processes to detect things visually much more effectively than through um, other processes. And being able to pick out a lion amongst a sea of grass was literally life and death at one stage. So being able to see differences in, um, in graphs is also a relatively easy thing for our brains to actually process. Okay, that said, there are levels of data visualization and data interpretation. Um, and a simple graph is quite easy to provide and allow people to engage with and interpret, but they can be used to distort things. The most common example is by changing the scale. Um, 
if I show the difference in student performance, um, where students have improved from 98 to 99 to 100, um, if I show the scale on, on the y-axis on the left, ranging from 95 to 100, then it's a 45 degree, well, a very strong angle. So it looks as though there's a great improvement. If I show that on a scale of 0 to 100, then it's essentially a flat line and there can be no perceptible improvement. So how we actually present data through visualization can strongly influence how people interpret that data. So we have to be careful with how we actually utilize visualizations. But that said, that same power can be used to help people understand the messages you're trying to explain with the data. Okay, so this is a visualization. This is what's called an infographic, showing the relationship between aspects in data science, which is the process of creating visualizations um, and going from reality to various uses of data to explain and pro provide a, another perspective on what that means about the world, which then will help us make decisions. So Various uses of data can be to show the data um, fairly succinctly, but it can also allow us to think about that data in different ways. Um, can avoid distortions in the data or ex exacerbate those. It can present a lot of data in a very small space, whereas if you've got tables of thousands upon thousands of, of um, responses, that's many, many pages of, of um, space in your report. A graph of that same amount of data can take up less than a paragraph of space. Um, they encourage us to compare data, um, whereas if you've got lots of numerical data, getting people to compare them is actually fairly complex and difficult. But providing two graphs or two, um, two lines on the same line graph um, allows that comparison intuitively and various other aspects that you can explore um, around the use of data. So the first visualization we're going to look at is probably the most famous. This was Napoleon's army invasion of Russia. Really complex thing happened over many, many months um, and involved lots and lots of information. And how to explain it has been the subject of many books and treaties and so forth. But this particular graph shows from the left to the right the, the travel from well, Germany into Russia to Moscow. It also shows the number of casualties being taken, um, which is the, well, as the, as the size of the graph shrinks, it shows the number of people that are, are dying. And as the black one goes up, that's the number of deaths. Um, and it shows the temperature down the bottom. And throughout it all, it shows the geographical locations of where various stages of the army's progression was. So a huge amount of information being portrayed in a particular visualization. Now, there are various processes we can use for presenting data. One is a time series where we're trying to show changes over time and line graphs are fantastic for that. Um, we can have nice, lots of nice lines changing with dates down the bottom and seeing things in relation to one another, as you would have used with Google Trends. Then there's rankings, as we've seen with bar graphs in um, all our ideas, where we can show the differences between how people have responded to various questions. And there's also part to a whole, which is popularized by the use of pie charts. So what percentage out of a whole have different options been um, explored and adopted? Then we've got deviations where we want to show um, differences between two sets of data. And very often this is done with bar charts or line charts again. And a common one is budgets where you've got last year's budget and this year's budget. And you can quickly and easily see where different things have gone up or down. Uh, frequency distribution is another popular one. This is where um, 
how often different things are happening. And we often use what's a histogram for this, which has a medium uh, bell-shaped curve. And we can then see where things differ from that bell-shaped curve, which would be what would be expected, can then show us that things are happening that shouldn't be happening or were happening differently to what would be normally expected if it was a randomized bell-shaped curve. Then we have another term called correlation. Um, this starts getting involved a little bit more mathematics, but it's where we have two factors. So it may be age and student performance. And we can then plot those in what's called a scatter plot. And the resulting plots of different students and ages and so forth will then show patterns in that scattering. And if the pattern then shows a, a line, we can then sort of indicate a trend or some sort of correlation between um, the information being presented. We also have nominal comparisons where things are just being selected randomly, but then we can use bar charts to see what ones are being selected the most and so forth and think that. And finally, we have geographical geospatial um, mapping where we present data using maps and different colors and, and values that relate to the geographical location. So a range of different graphing types, but they're not the only way we can actually present data. We can also use um, shapes and colors and distances between them to help um, with that. A common one done with that is on weather maps where we use geographical data, but we have like pictures of suns and clouds and, and the clouds are representing rainfall and suns representing temperatures and stuff like that. Commonly used in primary schools, say, um, say we're having attendance data and we use little um, smiley faces for a number of students that are present on a particular day and maybe frowny faces for the number of students that are not attending or things of that nature. So we're using various icons and images to get across the data, get across what the information is showing, but in more, um, in ways that help us understand the data. So it may be the use of color. Um, and we'll see a few examples in a moment around things like that. Okay, the other aspect is we can build interactivity, particularly with digital uh, displays, where we can allow the participants as they explore the data to um, scroll through and move around the data or click on things and have things change. Um, and much more complex data sets can be explored through, um, uh, through visualizations and animations and graphics. So I'm going to look at a few of these. And there's a few more on the course website that you can have a look at in the um, slideshow that will take you um, into exploring how these computerized interactions can allow us to understand data and analyze the data more effectively. So the first of these is just um, what famous creative people do. And it shows us in sort of the, the aqua, the, the blue, um, the amount of time they sleep and the hours they sleep. So if we take Benjamin Franklin, he would generally wake up at 5 a.m. I can see on here and go to bed at 10. But um, uh, was it Balzac? He generally went to bed at one and woke up at six. So different people have different patterns, but then they spend different times working and being creative. Some people are creative in the mornings, some in the evenings, some across the day at different times. They'll have different times when they might exercise, different times for having, um, uh, being involved in leisure activities and eating and so forth, and other times doing their jobs or day jobs and things like that. So it's just an interesting way of comparing how the most famous people, the most successful people in society have structured their daily patterns. So another one that helps us look at trends, this is um, looking over time. This is uh, 2014 presented in the number of tweets that mention different events. And so we can see that certain key things happen during 2014 um, from the peaks of Twitter activity. So an easy data set to get access to. 
and a way of analyzing the major events of 2014 um, based on the responses that people have on that particular social media platform. But we can also use animation to assist. This is just a simple one showing um, the number of people for each age group from the 1950s through to the through to 2060. And it allows us quite easily to see certain bubbles. So there was a certain bubble of population called the baby boomers. So at the end of World War II, um, a lot of soldiers came home from being away for four or five years. And unsurprisingly, a lot of babies were born about a year later. Um, but that increase in population didn't continue. It reduced after that. But there was a big group of, of people that actually went through society. And it had a big impact upon education um, because there was a big bubble of um, students in the 1970s that required more schools to be built, um, more childcare, a whole lot of things that had to be put in place to accommodate that. So these things are significant and can have a long-term impact if we use the data to analyze and understand that they're occurring. We can also use um, data to represent different metaphors and help us explain things. So one thing is called the semantic web, which is trying to allow computers to understand um, different qualitative concepts. Um, and to do that, we have to make things understandable by computers. And computers are essentially very dumb. We have to make it very, very explicit for them to be able to interpret data. So the semantic web has been a very interesting exercise to try to make data understandable by computers. And by doing so, it helps it make, make it more understandable by human beings. And this just looks at the total size of um, countries and their populations and so forth and how it changes over time. And you can explore the different um, interactions by using the tool and seeing how things have been different in the past um, and so forth. Oh, so this one was a map of the internet. So this is how much um, different countries are utilizing the internet and how the US is utilizing it the most, but that wasn't always the case. Um, well, probably has been, but the other countries have been using it different rates in different ways. Okay, then we can start putting the data into context. So making meaning from that data. And one interesting one is universe scale. There's a range of these, but it allows us to change the scale and see what that represents. So we can go up in scale and see um, what size we would start seeing planets and then galaxies and then the whole universe. And we can go down in scale and what, at what size we would start seeing um, things at a mini scale, like for insects, and then what we might see a microscopic scale for viruses and things of that nature, and then down even further to a quantum scale where we start seeing atoms and quarks and things of that nature. So it's just interesting to get an understanding of the scale of the universe through using an interactive graphing tool, which presents data in a way that we can then explore it in an interactive way. Another one that I'm going to try and show you is looking at the change in music over time. So this particular uh, where are we? Um, this particular infographic is allowing us to look at how music has been popular over, well, not human history, but since the um, what was that, 1970s, or I think it's 1970s. And we can see various um, musical influences arising and how they result in other influences which result in other influences. And every decade or so, a whole new set of influences emerges as a generation which is to separate themselves from previous generations. 
and express that through musical taste. And the other advantage of this particular infographic and tool is that you can click on the various um, musical trends and get samples of what they represent. So there are other interactions that we can look at. Um, this one allows us to look at a series of data around, oops, around various countries. Um, and at the moment it's showing trade goods in 2010. But if we go back to 2000, we can sort of see how the relative trade balances were different back then. And as we move back up to 2010, the graph will change. We can also look at migration patterns over similar time periods. You can add in different countries, compare different countries and explore the data. And researchers can have a field day with these sort of data sets by examining this, looking at these various narratives that emerge through the exploration of the data and then writing them up and presenting them in their research. But it all starts with collecting the data through a research process and then thinking about ways of presenting that data um, to help it make sense to the audience, but also to um, yourself as you come to interpret the data. So this is another one looking at um, drones and how over time um, the use of drones has changed and the number of victims has increased or decreased over time. And it allows us to explore that data in different ways. So one of the arguments against drones is that they all happen out of sight and that we don't really have a good understanding of how many people are being killed each year or each day through the use of drones. And by presenting that sort of information in a infographic such as this, it allows people to um, engage with that data in other ways, such as looking at the number of children that have died, number of civilians versus the number of high profile targets that have been intended to be killed and things of that nature. Okay, just one last one. Um, this one is looking at um, data breaches and how many, how many times the information that's held by various companies and organizations have been hacked. Um, and this allows us just to sort of see the relative occurrences but also to have an understanding of just how widespread um, data breaches are. And so we can see that Facebook's lost um, 420 million records. Um, various other companies have lost um, other sets of data. Not quite sure why Facebook's there twice, but um, things of that nature. So the data can be explored again in a way that tells an interesting story about the data. So the final thing I want to explore with you is the concept of word clouds, which is a way of presenting particularly qualitative data, which often comes in various texts or um, survey responses, or sorry, interview responses, where you may have a large transcript of, of the participants' responses, or indeed some of the key words from a Delphi survey. And in a Delphi survey, we use it slightly different. We, we use the key word and then the frequency of responses to that word. Whereas more commonly, it's using the frequency of responses in a text where say in an interview transcript, you may explore how often the students, or the, in this case, the teachers have used the word administration versus other technologies they may have mentioned or other key things that were commonly referred to in the transcript or text. Now, it's often used in analyzing um, documents. I use it a lot in curriculum documents, um, looking at the number of times particular words are used in curriculum documents. 
or often more significantly, how often certain words aren't used, uh, particularly where those words may be particularly important for the topic that's meant to be um, examined by the text or by the research, but these aren't occurring in responses or in documents and things of that nature. So there's a lot of things that can be drawn out from uh, wordles or word clouds, and you can create them yourself very easily. Um, they simply, many of the online tools that we have um, allow us to put in a paragraph of text or a document and it will automatically generate the word cloud for us. Some other ones you put in the actual keywords and the frequency of those words, so the numerical value, like what you might do for all our ideas, where you have the responses and the, um, the most the number of times the or the the all their ideas rating value for those responses. Uh, whereas if you're doing a Delphi survey without all our ideas, without the co-joint pairs, you might have their responses and then the number of times um, each participant has voted for those responses and things like that. So word clouds are being used more commonly in research, um, sometimes a bit lazily. They do still need analysis and need to be interpreted um, and explained, um, but they can be an, another effective tool for visualizing data and presenting it in a way that people can then interpret. So that's just an example of a very small word cloud um, taken from all our ideas where it took the major responses and the value that was assigned to them and generated the word cloud based upon the size of the word um, was determined by the, the score and the word cloud tool will just arrange things so that they look effective or take up the least amount of space um, on a particular set of set of space or page. So that brings us to the end of our examination of um, consensus research methodologies and I encourage you to have a go at looking at these different um, tools, particularly the visualization tools, have a go at creating your own word cloud. Um, one option is to uh, get a page from your favorite book, just do a, a search or get a Wikipedia entry for your favorite book or story put it into a word cloud, generate the wordle or the word cloud, and then post that into Teams so that others can try to see if they can interpret what the book was purely from the word cloud that's generated from the text that you provided about the book. That's it for this week. I look forward to seeing you in the tutorials.